Okay, Jai Jagannath, Jai Shri Krishna. We are uh, doing another study uh, period session. So um, we are reading Bhagavad Gita, chapter seven, from verse twenty-three. So um, this is a very interesting verse that many people misunderstand. Uh, let's try to clarify it in the best possible way. The verse goes, Persons of less intelligence seek temporary benefits. Those who worship the devas go to them, but my devotees come to me. Okay, as we were mentioning last time, Krishna is not saying that the people who worship the devas are less intelligent. Um, the less intelligence refers to the fact that people believe that the devas are different and separate and independent from uh, Ishwara. So for each particular thing that the people want to get, they uh, seek these temporary, they go and, and ask for temporary benefits from different devas. Um, like, for example, if they want uh, uh, health, they go to Surya. If they want uh, uh, wealth, they go to Kuvera or uh, Lakshmi. If they want uh, uh, good luck in, in uh, business, they go to Ganesh. If they were, and so on and so forth. Now, we have explained uh, previously that uh, worshipping and meditating on a particular form and personality of God is actually stimulating or uh, evoking that quality in ourselves. Be because we become similar to what we worship. We are attracted to what we worship. So Krishna is saying here, uh, uh, whoever, whatever you worship, you will go there. So those who worship the devas go to them, but my devotees come to me. This doesn't mean that uh, worshiping the devas and going to the devas is a bad idea. But usually people worship the devas just to get material benefits. Who are the devas? Unfortunately, the word deva has been translated as demigod because uh, the people who use this this term for translation didn't have a clear idea on what a demigod is. A demigod is uh, the uh, progeny, the, the child, generated by the physical union between a deva and a mortal human being. So the only demigods in the Hindu Vedic uh, system are, for example, the Pandavas, and uh, their uh, uh, grand uncle, Bhishma. Um, Indra is not a demigod, <laughs> and definitely Shiva is not a demigod. Now, when Krishna here is mentioning the Devas, he is talking about uh, the um, material um, manifestation managers, the Adityas, in, you know, starting from the Adityas. Shiva is not among them. So Vishnu is not among them, and the Mother Goddess is not among them. Because Vishnu, Shiva, and the Mother Goddess are directly the Parambraman. Now, we know that there is a difference from the, you know, between the Parambraman, 
Visvamsa and the Vibhinamsa and the Shakti Vesha. Uh, this is also very uh, well known, perfectly verifiable. So the people who worship the Deva such as Indra, Agni, etc. are performing the ritualistic duties of the Karmakanda. The ritualistic duties of the Karmakanda are meant to help the human being, the civilized human being, who is supposed to perform these ritualistic duties, uh, to help the human being to become, to develop a relationship of friendship and cooperation with the devas who are managing the universe. But that is not supposed to be a selfish worship. It's a duty that we, we, we perform to help to cooperate in supporting the universe. Now, today people when they do some yajna for some deva or some puja for some deva is because they want some temporary benefit. That's because they are, they are not so intelligent. Even when we worship the devas through the karma kanda with the homa and hopefully the soma and you know all the Vedic uh, rituals, we are not supposed to perform them to ask for something. We are supposed to perform them to give something to the devas, you know, and develop a stronger relationship to support them. Of course, as Krishna says, those who worship the devas go to them. So when we worship the devas in the karma kanda rituals, because there is no particular bhakti or tantric uh, method to worship uh, these, you know, like Indra or Agni or whatever. It's just a ritual, uh, ritual uh, worship of the Karmakanda. Um, but if we follow the proper system of the ritualistic duties of the Karmakanda or Uttarami uh, Mamsa, Uttarami Mamsa is a philosophical perspective, the Purvami Mamsa is the a ritualistic perspective. So when we develop this relationship with the devas, even if we don't ask for anything, if we are not seeking any particular benefit, we have ex actually established a relationship with the devas. So when we leave our present body, we are naturally entitled to go and stay with the devas. That's a good thing, <laughs> because living together with the devas, you know, living on the on the uh, higher planets, swarga and everything, is considered the best thing that can happen to someone from the, for example, the Abrahamic per perspective. You know, the Christians want to go to paradise, and the Muslim want Muslims want to go to the Jinnah. It's called Jinnah, I, I suppose. Uh, if I remember well, you know, and the and the uh, the, the Israelites, or the, the the Jews want to go to the uh, God's kingdom, you know, the Messianic kingdom, but that is a you know they is, is, they, they consider it a paradise. So Swarga is actually a, a good place, and the devas are also devotees of of Ishvara. They are actually partial manifestations of Ishvara, separate manifestations of Ishvara. So it's not a bad place, but it's a temporary place because it's still a material place. Now, if we are uh, satisfied with uh, sufficient healthy material pleasure, 
we naturally move on to moksha, to liberation. Now, going to Swarga is not liberation, because the devas also have to die and take birth again. So, it's not out of the samsara. And Krishna says in Gita, Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punara Varti You know, from Brahma Loka to, you know, to here and, and, and below, everyone has to die and come back and take birth again. So, if we are tired of dying and take birth, taking birth again, if we want uh, to overcome the conditioning, the identification and attachment to the material body, we have to focus on Ishvara. So Ishvara means Vishnu Shiva Shakti. This is Vedanat. Ishvara can never be separated from Shakti. Ishvara always has Shakti. Now, Vishnu is called Shiva when he manifests in the material world for the benefit of the uh, of the all the living beings of the jivas. When Shiva is not manifested in the material world, is called Vishnu, or in some expression, Sada Shiva. Maha Vishnu is Sada Shiva. Is that clear? Is everything clear up till now? If you yeah. Want, yeah, if you want to elaborate or ask or anything, please interrupt me anytime. Okay. okay. So we have a difference here, a distinction between the devas and Ishvara. Because Ishvara is eternal. Ishvara is transcendent not limited in any way. So when it, Bhagavad Gita is explaining when we attain that we we realize ah, Jan Makarma Chamedivyam Evam Yogeti Tattotaha. When we actually understand the Janma and the Karma of the avatars, the, the divine Janma, not the ordinary Janma, the divine Janma, divine activities. The, the, the manifestation of the avatars, of Ishvara, we don't have to take birth again. Because we, we really understand, tatvataha, not that, oh yeah, I know Krishna, you know, I've seen some photos, you know, I've seen some pictures of Krishna, you know, there uh, eating butter, or, you know, playing the flute. Ah, uh, that is not exactly knowing Krishna in, 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 in reality. We need first to realize Brahman, then we can realize Paramatma and Bhagavan. Otherwise, you know, any mental projection can uh, be mistaken, can be mistaken for, for God. So we have to actually be very careful. So what, do, what is the meaning of going to Krishna, a devotee going to Krishna? A devotee has to be a devotee, <laughs> uh, not uh, some superficial, sentimental, cultural buff. You know, oh, I like Krishna. You know, I, I, I paint Krishnas. Yeah, right, OK. Uh, that's that's not exactly a guarantee that you know, you know you know Krishna. Is everything is is clear now? Huh? A, another yes. Another point is that these persons of lesser intelligence who seek temporary benefits might be seeking these temporary benefits from Krishna himself, right? <laughs> the funny yeah. thing that they don't uh, they don't realize because they don't actually know Krishna is that Krishna never gives any material benefit. <laughs> in fact, uh, in the Uddhava Gita, Krishna says, "When I favor someone, 
I take away all the material possession and relationships and whatever good things that person has, materially speaking. That is why Krishna is called Dinabandhu, is called Akinchana Gocharam, because Krishna doesn't give temporary benefits. Krishna takes care of the devotee. He makes sure that the devotee is always protected, you know, in a good way. But uh, Krishna never gives uh, material, temporary benefits by themselves. If you want something from Krishna, Krishna will not give it to you. Krishna will give you what you need, not what you want. That's a different thing. You may think that you need, you know, a nice house, a good job, a lot of money, you know, a lot of whatever. But that's, they may not be a fact. You might just want them but not need them. What you need is to learn that everything here is temporary. And temporary benefits are not good for you. Because they distract you from the actual purpose of life. Because you think, oh, okay, you know, I made it. I'm okay now. <laughs> you know, the problem is that everything is temporary. So we lose everything. And when we lose everything, if we have invested our consciousness of those temp on those temporary things that we lose, we are also lost because we don't know what we are anymore. And that's not good for us. Is, is that clear? So s s some people think that, you know, Krishna wants us to disrespect and neglect the devas and whatever material desire we, we have, we should ask him. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's not going to work. So, um, we have to be careful not to misinterpret the verse. Then, let's go 24. Those who are... I think we've covered this, yeah. this part till the like, end of this chapter. We have to start from next chapter. I thought on that uh, ch that topic of Deva was elaborate. That's why you again brought that verse. But in last session, we finished this. Chapter. Oh, we finished the chapter. Oh, sorry. Okay. Oh, you're right. You're right. You're right. Thank you for reminding me. Huh. Okay. That is so. Now it is the chapter eight. Am yeah. I right? Yes. Taraka Brahma Yoga, Yoga and Transcendental Liberation and Liberating Spiritual Existence. Okay. So verse 1, Arjuna said, O Purushottama, Krishna, Supreme Person, what is Brahman, what is the Adhyatma, what is Karma, and what are the realities called Adibhuta and Adhidaiva? So these are the uh, topics we are going to see in this chapter. O Madhusudana, Krishna, how is the the Adhyagya residing in this body and how you will be known at the time of death by those who are engaged in yoga. So you, you understand the previous verse. Huh? So uh, Adhyatma, uh, Karma, Adhibhuta, Adhidaiva. Adhyatma is the Atman, okay, the living entities. Karma is action, Adhibhuta is the material world, and Adhidaiva yeah is the controlling principle incarnated by the archetypal devas, like as we mentioned before, the Adityas and, and the Vasus and, and everything. So this is clear. The Adhyagya also we have understood because the Adhyagya is uh, Ishvara, right? So these are the main subjects of the Bhagavad Gita, in fact. So let's go verse one. The law is uh, one. Sorry, three. 
<laughs> the first verse of the answer means verse 3. The Lord said, Brahman is the transcendental, supreme, unchanging existence, which means Aksharam. Aksharam Brahma Paramam. The intrinsic nature of the being, uh, Swabhavo uh, Adhyatma, is called Adhyatma. Swabhavo, the intrinsic nature of the being is called Adhyatma. Means, um, the Atman is existence, the, ex the being, the existence, individual existence. And karma is described as a creative action that causes the state of existence, the bodies, the nature and the birth of the embodied beings. Karma is a creative action. Is that clear, huh? So, creative action means... Yeah. Um, based on uh, Ahankara. Okay. Is to do something, to create an action that will cause a reaction. Okay. Usually karma is considered to be a good, uh, to have a good meaning because karma is the uh, dutiful action that will bring uh, a good result. Okay. Then we have verse 4. O best among those who have a body. The Adibhutam is a physical manifestation of the universe and is undergoing constant transformation. The Adhidaivatam is the principle of consciousness manifested as the controlling archetypes in the universe. And I am the Adhiyanya, the divine principle that resides in each body as the Param Atman. Okay. So, it's clear enough, eh? The difference between the, the, the Devas and Yajna, Yajna is Vishnu. There is a difference, but it's not a separation. The difference between the Devas and, and Vishnu is that Vishnu is the entirety of the devas. The devas are just limbs, parts of the body of Ishwara. Param Brahma. Okay. And five. One who at the end of time of this life remembers me while leaving this body, his body, attains my nature. There is no doubt in this. So Mad Bhavam means my nature. When we speak about uh, Dham, you know, it is the nature of God. So Vaikunta, Goloka, Vrindavan, you know, or whatever spiritual planet is not a physical place. We have to understand. It's not a materially physical place. Is a state of consciousness. Of course, we can perceive and interact with the the swabhava, swadhama of God, proportionate in proportion to how we develop a siddhadeha. A Siddhas Rupa. Rupa and Bhava are very strictly connected. If we develop the Bhava of Krishna, the feeling, the perception, the consciousness of Krishna, then we develop the Swarupa, the Siddha Deha, that is required to interact effectively with Krishna or Vishnu, or, you know, but we, we are talking about Krishna here, Bhagavad Gita is, you know, Krishna speaking, so he said me, so we say Krishna. Okay, now, uh, this, uh, this Bhava means nature and existence. The Dham is the result, is the production, is the same as 
nature and existence. Is that clear here? Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> because, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's not easy to, to um, figure, you know, to, to contemplate the existence of something <coughs> that is totally transcendental, that is not limited by time and space, but still is very real. So, you know, anyway, we can, we can elaborate more if needed. Then we go on, verse 6. I just want one question here. Please, please. This uh, concept of uh, Swabhava, yes. uh, so it, uh, yes. like, you know, it, it uh, represents the like state of consciousness yes. in a way. So can't we say same thing for Swarga and Narka also, that they are also not Loka, but like in a state of consciousness that you are um, in misery or... And okay, yes, mm -hmm. but they are still material. They're not transcendental. Yeah, but they still like you know they are not they are not some they're physical not loka or whatever they they're not gross. Yeah. That in this sense, okay. yes. They are in different dimensions. They're not gross uh, planets that we can find if we go around, you know, with, with the NASA probes. That NASA probes will never find them. No no matter how powerful your telescope, you'll never find them because they are not in this dimension and they are not made of gross elements but, but when like you know bhagavatam describes yes. or any other scripture describes uh, like uh, the punishment in hell or uh, some uh, benefits in swarga so how to interpret that is it uh, like we should take it as metaphorically or no no uh, they, are, they are very real they are very real but they are not um, on the same level of our uh, physical experience. They can manifest on our level of physical experience because they are more powerful. It's not that they're less powerful. They're more powerful. But they are made of a dis different substance that they are made of a subtler substance this is particularly true for what concerns swarga because that's more power than you know more powerful than than uh, martia loka okay swarga loka is more powerful than martia loka so the devas can actually manifest on you know our gross uh, level you know, they, they can touch us, you know, they can be seen by us, they can, uh, uh, you know, they can have a personal relationship with us, we can, you know, they, they can even have children with us. That's Swarga Loka level. But they have a much greater control on the gross matter than we normally have. Even human beings who have um, acquired, developed the yoga siddhis, they can do things that, they're, you know, that appear incredible to ordinary human beings. Like, for example, the Laghima Siddhi. Laghima Siddhi is the uh, power of becoming uh, 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 extremely light, you know, light as a feather. <laughs> you know, these yoga siddhis are not very difficult to get. You know, Patanjali says that some people are born with these siddhis because they did, uh, they, 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 you know, developed these siddhis in previous lifetimes. Uh, some people can acquire these siddhis through mantra. Or uh, we can also acquire this city through particular herbs, medicinal plants. But of course, it goes together with the, 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 the protocol. <laughs> In, it's not just that you eat the, the plant and puff, you get the yoga cities. No. 
the, the plants are uh, required to help detach you from the gross physical plane and to activate some parts of your uh, body that are a bridge between the Anamaya Kosha, the Pranamaya Kosha, and the Manamaya Kosha. These different Kosha uh, uh, sheets, they're, they're called sheets, no? uh, it's like coverings. They're not um, detached and independent from each other. They're all connected. Like we have chakras in our prana maya kosha, in our prana body, that are connected to the physical body. So if we, we you know, push a, 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 a nadi or a marma or a chakra, you know, we'll have an, you know, an effect on the, on the subtle body. You know, this is uh, the, the um, meridians of uh, uh, Shatsu, reflexology, and traditional Chinese medicines, medicine that has been learned from the science of yoga. So when you have uh, the energy currents that are called the nadis, if you open up the, the dead body, or even an, a living body, <laughs> you know, you cannot find them because they're like electrical currents. Can you see electrical current? Can you see the sound? You cannot see the sound, <laughs> you know, but the sound is there, it's very real, you know, and the sound can also manifest physical forms. The mind can manifest physical forms, you know, so... Let's say, for example, ghosts, okay? Some ghosts are, you know, uh, helpless because they don't know how to use the mind. They, they only have the mind. They don't have a, a gross physical body. You know, otherwise, they wouldn't be ghosts. Uh, but they have a, 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 the mental body, the body made of mind, the karmashaya, the, the mano, manamaya kosha. It's, it's still there with them, the, the, you know. So, if they learn how to use their mental body, they can do things on the gross physical level on, that we are familiar with. You know, they can move stuff. <laughs> you know, they can make a, you know, appear in, in, in very credible manifestations. They can uh, interact with the with the, your electrical sis installations. They can, uh, you know, they can do a lot of stuff that is on a material, gross material level. You can see, you know. So sarga is a bit like that, but much better. <laughs> sarga, the devas who live in sarga. And also the people, the human beings who go to Swarga because they have been nice and good and dharmic people, you know, they can manipulate matter, they can uh, manifest, they can put together, you know, material atoms and they can uh, dissolve them, you know, the, this uh, Kamala Sayuta Siddhi, uh, Prakamya Siddhi, Kamala Sayuta uh, Siddhi, um, uh, you know, there, there are so many things that devas could, can do on this material level. But they are not limited by time, space, and individuality. Means a yogi, human yogi, can uh, normally manifest up to, I think, eight or nine uh, by location forms. Well, the devas can, can do more because, you know, every time you, you light a match, you light a candle, Agni is there. You know, so, so the devas are not limited by individuality. They, they can be present everywhere. But their presence 
is still limited by the fact that they have material body. A transcendental body has no limits. So this is uh, is different. It is uh, in Naraka, in Naraka is even uh, different because not only uh, we, if we are in Narak, you know, we don't have uh, the power of the devas, we don't have the power of the humans, and we are prisoners of our own mind and the sense of guilt. Naraka is not a place. It's a nightmare. And in this sense, in the last few, you know, decades, uh, Hollywood, for example, has given a very good uh, perception of what Naraka is. You know, so with all these horror films and, and, and stuff, you know, that they show it's pretty, practically like a nightmare. A night in a nightmare, we actually have feelings. We suffer. We enjoy. You know, because we don't need a material body to do that. Now, a deva knows how to manipulate, bo you know, all the elements to enjoy and has the power to do it. A, a poor person in, <laughs> in Africa doesn't have any power. So that, that's a very bad place to be, but it's not a physical place. It's not that you, if you dig, you know, under the, the earth crust, you'll find hell. <laughs> no, 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 not, not happening, not happening. Uh, the, the concept of hell has been uh, uh, a superimposition of lots of uh, different cultural concepts. Uh, uh, hell is, uh, in fact, a Norse uh, word coming from the, uh, the, the Northern people's language, the Viking, if you will. And um, there is a, the a city, the, the capital city of Finland, that is called uh, Helsinki. But hell in the Norse uh, mythology or philosophy uh, is, is not uh, a place of torture with the devils and everything. <laughs> It is simply a, a place where people are sad and cold because they they know that they could have done something better in their life was was still the well alive. So in, in some places hell is cold, some places hell is hot. <laughs> in some, some cultures. They believe that, hell, you know, the Christian culture basically uh, is fixated with the, f you know, the fire of hell because of a mistranslation of the, of the Gospels, you know, so the people with each different, you know, each subsequent generation have been adding and adding and adding to the mythology of hell, so now people think that hell really exists. No such thing as hell, uh, you know, in, in the, as described by Christians. That, that is totally, uh, it's, it's not true. It doesn't exist like that. So Naraka is a nightmare. Swarga is a, a, a place of, uh, of pleasure. Not happiness, but pleasure. You know, if you're happy, with pleasure, then it's <laughs> then you're happy, but because it's temporary, it can never be real happiness. Because we we aspire to sat eternal existence. We we exist eternally, but everything in the material world will have an end. You know, will finish. So. Um, when we leave the body, 
here, say yam yam vapi is maram bhavan, bhajatyante kalevaram, tam tam evaiti kontaya sadas tad bhava bhavita. Means at the, when, when we leave the body, we are free from the body, so the mind can zip zap and zoom everywhere. <laughs> You know, wherever there is something that will attract the mind, then the mind will carry us. So that's why it's so important to train the mind, control, learn to control the mind in this way. Because what we remember, we, uh, is, is what we have contemplating. You know, like, uh, whatever you think, whatever you use to think, whatever you um, become accustomed to thinking, that will be the type of consciousness to which your mind will jump as soon as you leave the body. The body is keeping you in one place. You know, you leave the body, ha, <laughs> you, are all, you are all over the place. And... Whatever is, um, you know, y you are accustomed to, to meditate and contemplate, you just uh, zoom there I instantly. So attachment is not just positive attachment, it also, can also be negative attachment. And this is the funny thing, you know, because it's not fun, but, you know, it's funny. Um, when uh, you are, uh, you know, let's say um, that you have uh, cats or dogs or very attached to cats or dogs or whatever pet animal, you know, at the time of death you think about your pet animal and zap, you get an animal body. You are very attached to your family. Uh, why if oh, you have very strong uh, you know desires for, for 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 women let's say someone not you but in general uh, then what will happen when they die they will be attracted to take uh, a female body they will be born women. women even if they despise women, women. And the more they despise women, the more they contemplate women, and the more surely they will be born as women. People who always think about enemies, especially when it is a, you know, a, a, a different uh, a community of, of enemies, like they say, you know, Israelis and Palestinians. <laughs> okay, because you know, now everybody is talking about that. So, one Palestinian who, you know, is always contemplating the Israelis in hatred and, uh, you know, uh, he wants to kill them, he wants to, uh, uh, you know, and always think about the Israelis. What do you think will happen when he dies? He will be born as an Israeli. You know, and the other way around. So, we understand how, you know, actually knowing and understanding the law of karma will actually, you know, and, and reincarnation, can really solve all the problems of the world. Because people see their bodies, and that's the, that's the, the problem. That's a mess. If someone knows that he's not the body, and when he leaves the body, he will go and develop another body that is based on what he, was, he has been contemplating, hatred will become clearly <laughs> something to drop. Because by cultivating hatred, you're contemplating your enemy. And contemplating your enemy you will take birth as your enemy. There is no, no way around. If we understand that, why should we hate anyone? We will become them. 
So you, you, you see the point. You see the development. Yeah. The, the development is <laughs> it's done. This material world is engineered in such a way as to teach us, you know, uh, how to live. You know, how to behave to improve the uh, our present and our future and the present of the, and the future of the people around us. So, yeah, people are thinking about you. Okay, so, let's go on, maybe another class. <laughs> Therefore, at all times, you should always remember me, even while fighting this battle, dedicating to me your mind and your intelligence. In this way, you will certainly come to me. So this means that we have we, we can still go on and do our things, fight our battles, but um, we, we don't fight our battles because we want to get something. So we are not contemplating about the enemies through hatred or uh, spite or, you know, what, or fear or whatever. We just do our best. And the enemy is just an instrument that uh, comes to us to do our service, you know? Yeah. If uh, we are Kshatriyas, we, our service is to fight, to defend the Dharma. So if somebody is attacking us, when we defend ourselves without hatred, without uh, uh, selfishness, without egotism, then we don't produce any karma. You know, and we are always free because you know whatever happens, it's okay. That is why Krishna is saying, "Balam balatam nasmi kama I am the strength of the strong that is free from attachment and lust. The lust doesn't mean specifically, you know, about the uh, sex. Lust is the uh, greed to get gratification from something. Could be anything. We, someone can last for money, you know, can last for recognition, last uh, for whatever, you know, so last it is. You know, name, fame, adoration, and profit. You know, these are all forms of lust. So if someone is free from attachment and any form of lust, then they can uh, fight, they can engage the strength, and they will be always free from karma. Right? So karma is, is not so much about the action, but about the intention about the choice, about the, the consciousness. So that's, again, it's all about consciousness. Okay, one more, any question? No, just, just one thing here, this, when Krishna says Maam Anushmara, like remembering him, Yeah. so is it only when you said that you, like, you know, we shouldn't be uh, hateful or those things only having positive quality or remembering particularly Krishna or that, like yeah, how... Yeah, you know, remembering Krishna is the purpose. The... Um, that should be... In. The activity, the, the duty that we perform is not the purpose. It's the instrument. It's the instrument of our service to Krishna in the sense of the Virat Purusha. We are serving all beings. You know, like, uh, like Krishna says so many times in Gita that one has to work for the benefit of all beings. And uh, all beings together, you know, are part of God. So uh, when we um, engage 
in serving the universal community with our professional duties, social duties, family duties, we can do that in full Krishna consciousness by knowing that we are doing the service to Krishna. So we do it not to have something for ourselves, not for our own uh, benefit or for the benefit of our uh, you know, enlarged uh, self, like family, uh, community, I mean, uh, you know, uh, separate community, you know, uh, race or nationality or, or species or anything. Community, when we speak of community, we speak of the universal community. All beings, Krishna, in Gita doesn't say you work for the benefit of your uh, 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 co-citizens. <laughs> no, <laughs> or the benefit of your uh, fellow Hindus. Yeah, no, it's uh, for the benefit of everyone, all beings. Not you know, not even for your fellow men or human beings, for all beings. Sarva Bhuteshu, Sarva Bhutani. You know, Sarva Buddha means all beings. Now, um, when we have this Krishna consciousness, we don't need to always visualize any particular activity of Krishna. We just need to put the intention the choice to the, the, the motivation because you know now we are in the last uh, days of Kartik. Okay, tomorrow we you know Panchaka is starting, the well, last five days of Kartik. So of course we can meditate on Hada Krishna, that the Rasa Lila and 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 uh, etc. But you, you don't have to do it exactly in that way. Like, you know, here Krishna and Arjuna are on the battlefield. Okay. Uh, when Arjuna said, asked Krishna, how can we meditate on you? How will we remember you at the time of death? You know? And he says, Krishna is not telling him. You know, okay, you know, think about me in the Rasa Lila. You know, and just go and chant your japa. No, that, that's not necessary. Because Krishna, you know, is showing in Bhagavad Gita how to meditate on, 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 on God. You know, and Krishna doesn't tell Arjuna, oh, okay, you don't want to fight because you don't want your friends and relatives to kill each other and you want to be part of this huge mess. Okay, you know, sit back. Here is your japa mala. <laughs> you know. And sit back and chant, and you know, if you want, we we, we go back uh, to maybe we can go to the Himalaya, or we go to uh, some uh, you know quiet place, a quiet temple, and just chant your japa, and don't worry about the war. <laughs> Does he say that? Uh, of course he doesn't. You know, so. The practice of yoga with a focused consciousness does, that does not deviate from the object of meditation, you know, means that we remember, we realize, we are aware that we are Brahman, that we are serving Brahman, we are, and everything is part of Brahman. You know, and we are perfectly aware what is the what are the principles of Dharma. So we are not going to fall from from the, the path of dharma and vidya. Is, is does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you, you you want to elaborate more? Or we stop here. Uh, no, no, that's fine. We can move on, or okay, is it the time already? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I I I'm taking it. Uh, you know, this, because these verses are so, uh, so important, so 
uh, heavy with, with meaning and uh, they're so easy to misinterpret. Because if someone is reading these verses superficially, they can get very weird ideas. You know, just like uh, I remember when I was on Facebook, there were some people who were so angry with the Christian Chaitanya because they they blame Christian Chaitanya for the you know the, the degradation and, and mess and disaster of Hinduism. You know, <laughs> because they say that Christian Chaitanya was uh, telling all the good people to give up whatever you know work in the kingdom they were doing uh, like Ramananda Roy like uh, 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 what was his name again uh, the king of, uh, of, of Puri um, you know and, and convincing them to just uh, you know, retire from everything, just sit under some tree somewhere and chanting Hare Krishna. Uh, no, <laughs> that's, that's not the case. Because, uh, yeah, King Prataparudra, I remember his name. So, Prataparudra never left his uh, position as a king, you know, and uh, frankly, <laughs> If he had stopped being a king and retired as a Babaji, just chanting, you know, the, the, the Krishna's name on, you know, on the Japa, that would have been better because he have, you know, he would have done less damage. Because Pratyaparudra was an idiot. You know, he destroyed Orissa not by defending Orissa from the Muslim and sultans and, you know, Muslim invaders. He destroyed Orissa by waging war against the last Hindu kingdom of India, Vijayanagar. <laughs> so, you know, how is that motivated by spirituality? You know, going to, uh, Orissa going to war against Vijayanagar, how, what, what is the idea of spiritual there? You know, and he had 18 sons, one worse than the other. There was no good training, no good, you know, teaching, no dharma, no vidya. You know, and at the end, he, you know, he, he was, uh, when, when Prataparudra died, his chief minister killed all his sons. <laughs> or Prataparudra sons and put himself on the throne. So, Prataparudra was not even able to, to choose a chief minister who, who, you know, who was not a total disaster. You know, and, and uh, I don't remember now, I think, uh, um, Gopal Vidya something. I don't remember the name of this chief, chief minister, but uh, this chief minister, after killing all Prataparudra's sons, uh, he, he sat himself on the throne, starting the Boy dynasty, which Boy means, uh, um, means uh, outcast, sweeper, street sweeper. You know, Boy dynasty, and within three, uh, three passages, of, you know, kingdom of kingship, you know, the entire dynasty crumbled and or Orissa was totally taken up, uh, you know, by, by the Islamists and then by the Marathis and then by the British. So, <laughs> it's not that Prasvarudra, you know, was ruined because he was chanting too much and thinking about Radha Krishna too much. I you know. Uh, Anyway, so, yeah, this is, uh, we, we need to give some, some solid knowledge to people, you know, so oh. they, can, uh, they can know what to do today, you know, in these days, uh, what to do. Okay, so, um, yeah, 
I thank you for uh, your support in this uh, important work. Because thank you for your you're, time. Yeah, you're pushing me to do this, <laughs> which is good. <laughs> I hope your health is allowing you to do it. Exactly. Yeah, well, you know, it's, uh, it's important. It's important. Okay. So, um, anything else for today? Okay. So, looks, uh, looks not. Okay, so thanks, Jai Jagannath.